Well, good morning, good afternoon, good whatever, good middle of the night if you're watching this in the middle of the night. Um, those of you that are watching probably know me, but those of you who may have just found me by accident, I'm Pastor Brian Meadows of Zion Lutheran Church and School here in Rapid City, South Dakota. It is April the 5th, Palm Sunday, 2020, uh, and it's quite possibly the strangest Palm Sunday I've ever been to. Uh, we had no palm processionals. We had no palms. We only had about five of us in the sanctuary recording service earlier this morning. I uh, hope you got a chance to watch that. That's on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Probably somewhere around this video that I'm posted on YouTube here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but we're going to do some Bible study. Um, missing adult Bible study. So we're just going to do Bible study via video for now. Um, if you have any questions or comments about about the study itself, about uh, questions, comments, or um, about the format, please get a hold of me. You all should have my email, brian.meadows at zionrc.org, um, or call the church office or my cell phone. Either or, you should have that as well. Um, so, about 20 to 30 minute Bible studies. We'll put them on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you enjoy. Um, again, if you've got comments, questions, let me know. So we're going to jump right into it. Today we're going to be discussing the crushing truth. Now, of those of you that are following along at home and that have uh, been following along with our Bible studies as we had laid them out, this was actually for uh, March 22nd, a couple of weeks ago. But this is talking about the crucifixion and or Palm Sunday. And we didn't get a chance to do this together, so I thought let's go back and uh, align things with where we're at in the church calendar. So we're going back to the crucifixion, specifically Matthew 27, 11 through 66. It's a crucifixion. It's a very familiar story. But follow along, read through the scriptures, find something that maybe you didn't see before, or maybe something that's hitting you in a different way uh, than it's hit you before. God's word speak to us, speaks to us differently at different times in our lives. So how is it speaking to you today? As we get started, let's do it as we always do it, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to hear your word. Uh, Lord, let it touch us in ways uh, that you would, you would see fit. Let us be molded into the people you would have us be. Let us always look towards Christ as our Lord and Savior. We pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, so let's get to it. Matthew 27, 11 through 26. We'll start with that part first. Matthew, 11, Matthew 27, 11 through 26. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, now at the, feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, whom you call Christ, who is called Christ? And they, they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, 
He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our, and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Okay, so what I would encourage you to do at this point, uh, sometime after this video, go through Luke 23 and John 18 and compare Luke and John to Matthew's account of, of Jesus and Pilate's interaction. There's some interesting things of how each one shows, shows this interaction in different light on, on how they're, what themes they're trying to push. But we're in Matthew right now, so let's stick to Matthew. Jesus is given to Pilate as king of the Jews. Now the accusation the priests are, are weighing against him when they're in their, their private session before they hand Jesus over to Pilate they're saying he's blaspheming that he's calling himself God and that because of the blaspheming he needs to be put to death. But that's not what they tell Pilate. They didn't tell Pilate that he's blaspheming, that he's calling himself God. The charge they're leveling against Jesus in front of Pilate is different. They're calling him now the king of the Jews. Why the difference? I think the difference is this. One, Pilate doesn't care what they do with their religion. Call whoever you want to call God. But he does understand. He might be threatened by someone being called God king because king might butt up against what is Caesar now you're talking about an earthly ruler and Pilate can't have that Pilate can't have an insurrection coming in his territory in Judea so that's why you'll notice the accusations the priest or the, the accusation from the from the priests by themselves to the accusation that they put before Pilate for Jesus, they're slightly different because they've got to convince Pilate that Jesus needs to die. So Pilate receives Jesus and he starts questioning Jesus himself. Are you the king of the Jews? And he gets just this short answer. You have said so. But then the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests all start weighing in on Jesus or, or wailing on him and, and in front of Pilate he's done this and this and this and this he's calling himself king he's standing in the way of Caesar you can see some of those accusations in Luke and John but Jesus doesn't say a word and Pilate is amazed by this why is, ama why is he amazed talk about that now we get on to the, the section with Barabbas. Now Pilate knows Jesus doesn't, hasn't done anything to deserve death. He's got one chance to release him. Every Passover it was, it was custom that, that the governor, this case being Pilate, would release someone from the jail. Now whether it was someone just in, 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 on death row, so to speak, or any of the prisoners, we don't know. But Pilate gives the people two choices. Barabbas, who's a murderer, who is a known insurrectionist, who has clearly gone against the Roman Empire and is a threat to not only the empire, but there are people who would stand against him. Jew, Roman, it doesn't matter. He kills indiscriminately. If you follow the logic or Jesus now what I love about Matthew's account is it's filled with symbolism it's filled with symbolism if we take a look at the larger picture standing before the people are, are two men a sinner and the spotless lamb of God one of them needs to die Clearly, it's Barabbas. He's the one who actually broke the law. Yet it's Barabbas that gets set free. You and I, we're Barabbas. Jesus takes our place. We're the known sinner. We're the ones deserving death. Yet it's Jesus who takes our place. You and I are Barabbas. 
Quick little point here. Pilate's wife comes to him and says, have nothing to do with that religious man. And it's, it's kind of glossed over. And I think this is an important point because what this teaches us is, guys, listen to your wives. Just saying, Pilate didn't got in a world of hurt. But he, 24th through 26, he delivers Jesus to be crucified. And now let's not beat up on, on Pilate too much here. You know, he didn't listen to his wife. That's, that's important. But what does he have to deal with? He's a governor of this kind of out-of-the-way portion of the empire. And he's governing, governing people that historically have not been governed too well. He's only about 160, 170 years, maybe a little more, give or take, away from the Maccabean Revolution, or the Maccabean Revolt where Israel rose up against the Roman Empire and for a period of about seven years ruled themselves, broke away from the empire. And we're only about 40 years, 30 or 40 years away from the next revolt where, where Rome's going to come in and level Jerusalem, specifically the temple. On top of that, there is an extra 40 to 60,000 Jews hanging out in Jerusalem right now for the Passover, and so you got a powder keg. Pilate doesn't play this right. He could start a revolution right here, right now, and so he's in a very precarious position. He needs the Jewish leadership to be on his side to help control the masses. So if it's one man that has to die, so be it. And then you get this, this very ironic, I would say one of the most ironic lines in the Bible. As he says, I'm done with it. I'm washing my hands of it. I, I, is, you want him dead? Fine, we'll do it. But it's on your head. And the people scream out, his blood be on us and our children. Really. It's exactly what was happening. But in a completely different way than they understood. In fact, that's what we pray. We pray that his blood be on us and our children. We pray, pray that that blood washes away our sins as we know it's going to. They don't know that. It's the same words, but means completely different than, than when a modern Christian says it and what they say. It's, it's ironic. Okay. Let's look at our next section. Matthew 27 27 through 38. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took a reed and struck, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled the man, this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. They sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put, they put a charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Now, what do you say here? I mean, Jesus is, is, has already been whipped. That's what scourging means in, in verse 26. He's been whipped. And now, taken in front of a whole battalion of soldiers, we're talking about 600 men, give or take. 600 men surround Jesus. I mean, this, the whole site's disgusting. They surround Jesus. They beat him some more. They mock him. Here's where we get the, the crown of thorns. Pull from a bush somewhere in the in the courtyard. They lay this robe on top of him, which can't have felt good at all with his back already ripped to shreds. All this is 
coming up to the cru- crucifixion is the reason why we need the crucifixion. It is the, the picture of, of the vileness, the depravity of a fallen humanity. Verses 32 through 38, we get Simon of Cyrene, who's drafted to carry the cross. Jesus is offered the wine mixed with gall, which is probably a narcotic, something to ease the pain, but he refuses. Why? Why does Jesus refuse? Think about that. Talk about that, if you would like. At any point, if you want to pause the video to talk about one of these questions amongst yourself, go for it, or watch the video and and talk about it afterwards. Your call. You're the one with the. You're the one in control. In this thir- verse 35, and they crucified him. They divided his garments among them by casting lots. Now here's the thing about this verse. When the original readers read this verse, when they read this line, they would have immediately be, been taken back to Psalm 22, verse 18. Now remember that psalm. We're going to come back to it in a second. But here's your moment of reflection after this, these verses. You read through the suffering of Jesus, the suffering that Matthew portrays in his gospel, what sticks in your head. Again, we've, we've read this several times. You, we've grown up with this as the central story to Christianity. But what sticks with you this time, specifically about his suffering, about the way he was beaten, the way he was hung, the way he was abused? And why do you think that's sticking in your mind today? Okay, let's go on to our next part. Matthew 27, 39 through 56. Excuse me. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would have destroyed the temple and rebuilt it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and the elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is a king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tomb also, and the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who had, who were who were with him keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to them, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So what's interesting about this first part, as the mockers came by throwing insults at Jesus, it sounds a lot like that temptation account we covered a couple weeks ago, only now instead of Satan, Satan's voice is coming through the bystanders, through the priests and the scribes. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. You saved others. Can't you save you? If you're the Son of God, 
Have God bring you down. You're the king of Israel. Come down from the cross and we'll believe you. But come on, really? Come down from the cross and we'll believe you? What do you think about that? Did they believe when Lazarus came back from the dead? Did they believe when the blind man was healed? Did they believe when he, they saw a lame man walk? If nothing to this point had convinced them, why would him coming down from the cross convince them? Why would him coming out of the tomb convince them? And he says, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, I told you we'd come back to verse or Psalm 22, and here we go. Again, Go through and read Psalm 22 sometime this week. What you're going to find is the very first verse of Psalm 22 is Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we have the, Psalm, the verse 18 dividing up his garments. Now here's the thing. When Jesus says this, the scribes and the priests that might still be there, they know. They know where he's getting this verse. They know it comes from the Psalms. And they know what this Psalm says. So yes, he is saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, God has forsaken his son on the cross. That's the whole deal. That's the point. That's why we can be here, because Christ has saved us. God has saved us through his son. But here's a dual meaning, if you'll follow. When you read Psalm 22, it's, it's pain and it's anguish. It is God abandoning his son. But when you get to the end of Psalm 22, it's hope. It describes the victory through God the Father. Now here's the thing, the scribes and the priests and the, the Pharisees, they know the end of Psalm 22. So when Jesus says the first line of Psalm 22, in their minds, they can get to the end of Psalm 22. Jesus is, maybe I'm reading into it, maybe I'm not, I don't know. But I think Jesus is doing a little taunting from the cross. You think you have won? God wins. God will be victorious. And I'm the Son of God. Now here we go. Verses 51 through 54. We get some amazing symbolism here. This is awesome. Again, the symbolism of you and I being Barabbas. Christ taking our place. Barabbas being set free. You and I being set free. That's the symbolism we saw earlier. Now we see the temple court curtain rip in two. The temple curtain that, that separated the temple common space from the Holy of Holies, from where God dwelt. And now the curtain is ripped in two and fallen off. There's no longer anything that separates man from God. God has come, and come to his people. He's removed sin and death, that which separates us from God. We're now in his presence. Don't need the temple curtain anymore. The bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, who had died, are now raised. I mean, this is the whole point, isn't it? This is the point of Jesus dying on the cross, so that death no longer means anything. Oh, death, where's your victory? Where's your sting? Where's your permanence? It's gone. We're going to follow these men and be resurrected. More so, we're going to follow Christ, who's going to be resurrected on Easter. And where these men will pass away again. Christ doesn't. And neither will you and I on that resurrection day. And then we get to the end where the Roman Gentiles, the Roman Gentile guards who have watched this whole thing unfold now recognize Jesus for who he really is. Okay, let's finish up. Matthew 27, 57 through... 57 through 66. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. 
And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go and make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. How is the theme of Jesus' abandonment at his death further continued into his burial? 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. What's sin? Sin is that which breaks us out of relationship. Relationship with God and relationship with fellow man. And so if Jesus became sin, we've already seen where he's been abandoned by God. And now in his death, he's buried alone. His disciples have run. His friends are gone. Only a few women remain. That's what sin does. It destroys our relationships. It it isolates us. It puts us alone. And Jesus became sin. And so he was buried. He died alone. He was buried alone. Forsaken by all. And Jesus is laid in the tomb. The tomb is sealed. Guards are posted. Everyone's gone. Their hope is gone. And the stage is now set for the greatest miracle this world has ever seen or will ever see until we see Christ return. Again, it's a familiar story. It's one as Christians we know we know very well. This is the central story of Christianity. But as you discuss this study, as you as you go through through this chapter, these, this reading. And as you compare it to Luke or John, as you read Psalm 22, what sticks in your brain? What sticks out to you? Discuss that as, as, you, as you watch this video or after the video. Again, if you have any questions or comments about the video or its format, please let me know. Email or phone call, either or. Until then. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. God bless you in your weeks. Amen.